Hi, thank you for joining the Weave online user group. Today's topic is an intro to service meshes and progressive delivery. Progressive delivery is uh, kind of a new term that encompasses things like uh, canary deployments, AB, blue green, etc. Um, I think it was a uh, um, red monk who kind of put the term out there, so it seems to be working. So you are in good hands today. You are with Stefan Prada, who is a developer experience engineer on our team here at our company called Weaveworks. Uh, my name is Tomo, and uh, I, I head the developer experience team here. And uh, if some of you have come in the past, you've known that these are sort of seasonal series that we do, um, bringing in guest speakers, having our own topics. Uh, for a while, we had some office hours, where it was more conversational. So uh, we've been kicking off this season with sort of more of a speaker series. So stay tuned. We'll be aiming to do, um, if not every Tuesday, almost every Tuesday, with a variety of topics that hopefully are useful for you. Uh, you know how to reach us as well. Um, uh, um, I'll add the um, info at the end on our Slack channels or email us. So if you have any particular burning topics that you'd like us to cover, then uh, please let us know. Hopefully my slide will advance. So a little bit about us. Uh, if you've come to us through very various channels and you haven't heard us before, our company is called Weave Works. Uh, we're a startup based in London, San Francisco, Berlin, and distributed teams. Uh, our CEO and CTO and some of our engineers are the people who created the technology and the company, RabbitMQ, and then sold it to VMware. Uh, and then fast forward, they uh, built certain open source technologies as well as the company Weaveworks uh, and started as a Google venture and Excel partner startup. And we've recently also got additional funding to get us to the next place. So we're very excited. We're in a good place. Uh, a little bit about us, uh, if you don't know, we are very much founded on open source, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of people know maybe our earliest projects, uh, like WeaveNet, which is really um, one of the best ways to network in Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have Cortex, which is now in the CNCF. Uh, Flux, which is in process of going to CNCF stand Sandbox. Um, and you'll probably be hearing more about that because it's really kind of our core open source project around the concept of GitOps. Uh, we have Weave Scope for observabilities. Uh, um, sorry for observability and uh, Weave Flagger, who Stefan here created, and um, really creates a nice, seamless, and automated experience for progressive delivery for service meshes, which he will definitely talk about today. Uh, as for us, in terms of our paid products, many of you might know our SaaS product called Weave Cloud, uh, which helps you. Uh, monitor and do observability and do automated deployments. So it's sort of a SaaS version of some of the open source technologies that we um, have available um, and has them work together in a more uh, enterprise way. Uh, and then we're about to release our Weave Kubernetes platform. So we've been um, running Weave Cloud um, on Kubernetes on AWS for um, four years now. So we have four years of experience running Kubernetes in production. And as part of that, um, we created sort of our Kubernetes layer, which we are, we are now in the product of productizing. And it's a very GitOps aware enterprise Kubernetes um, uh, platform for running Kubernetes in production. Uh, and as part of that, sometimes people need some help. So we offer a little bit of consulting training and support around that. So our website is weave.works. If you haven't seen us, check us out. Thanks for listening to the pitch. <laughs> uh, so now on to our topic. As I mentioned, this is an intro to service messages and progressive delivery. Uh, we've got Stefan Prod in here from our team. Uh, we scope out an hour. Uh, we kind of aim for 30 to 45 minutes, but we can go um, you know, 45 minutes an hour depending on how many questions people have. Uh, as for questions, we are using a platform called Zoom. So the best way to send your questions is through the chat box. If you don't see the button for that, sometimes if you hit escape, you can get out of full screen mode and can see a little bit more of the Zoom capabilities. Uh, reminder, when you send a chat, please send it to everybody, uh, everyone in the, in the drop down, or sometimes it says to all panelists and attendees, depending on the Zoom version that you have. Um, unless you have something that you really privately only want to send to us, please make sure to send both your questions and answers to everyone because we've often had people getting pretty active in the chat and helping each other out, which is great. Um, otherwise, is a little bit, if sometimes if you're using Safari and you do copy paste, there might be some issues there. So just be aware of that. So done with the housekeeping. Oops, sorry. I will go back here. And uh, 
hand it over to Stefan. Let me know if you need me to stop sharing my screen. All right, looks like you're good. All good. Hi, folks. I'm uh, Stefan Prodan, uh, and today I'll be trying to introduce uh, introduce to you uh, service mesh concepts and talk about how progressive delivery um, can be applied using uh, service mesh uh, implementations. But first, let's uh, let's see what the service mesh is. I I've chose a very short uh, definition to encompass all the service mesh implementations. So I don't want to leave anyone uh, out. So a service mesh is a dedicated infrastructure layer for handling service to service communication. Um, this definition fits very well to a Kubernetes, let's say CNI implementation as well, right? Um, service mesh is something that runs on top of a CNI. So it builds on top of the CNI layer four capabilities and adds uh, layer seven capabilities. And we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Um, the main components of a service mesh are a data plane and a control plane. Uh, data plane is made out of uh, lightweight proxies. Um, a proxy is something like Envoy, like Nginx, like HA proxy, like all these technologies uh, could be used uh, to build your own service mesh. Uh, in Kubernetes, these proxies are distributed, distributed as sidecars. What that means, uh, that those proxies run uh, inside every pod near uh, next to your application. And the control plane um, is responsible for configuring those proxies um, is responsible for issuing TLS certificates and uh, most service mesh implementation come with a, a TLS certificate authority. They also have uh, policy man managers. Um, they collect telemetry and expose metrics. Uh, some service meshes also do um, distributed tracing. So, to explain a little how a service mesh can be helpful, I will start with a, with a simple example. Let's say we have a Kubernetes cluster and we have an app that's composed out of three services, a front-end service, a back-end service, and a database, right? Um, the blue arrows represents the north-south traffic. So north-south, um, means traffic that comes in your cluster through an ingress gateway. This ingress gateway can be an ingress controller like Nginx or um, um, a cloud-based uh, ingress like ALB and um, other offerings that uh, cloud vendors have and an egress gateway. Uh, now, Maybe you don't have an uh, egress gateway inside your Kubernetes cluster or don't use one. So you just use the, your nodes IPs when you uh, reach out to the internet. But um, in order to ensure better security of your system, uh, um, yeah, some products, uh, some clusters use egress gateways as well. So this is the north-south traffic. Uh, let's focus a little on the east-west traffic. So the east-west traffic is um, where the service mesh uh, usually interacts with your services. So let's say a request comes from the ingress. It reaches the front end. The front end calls the back end. The back end calls the database to get some uh, data uh, out of it. And let's assume it also calls an external service an API and has to reach out of the cluster. So if you use Kubernetes with this setup, um, there are a couple of issues you can run into. Um, one issue will be regarding to the backend database connection, right? Um, in Kubernetes by default, nothing 
is encrypted on the network layer. Even if you use, let's say, WeaveNet, WeaveNet only encrypts traffic between nodes. So if the backend and the database run on the same node, uh, that traffic will not be encrypted. Uh, the communication will not be encrypted. So let's assume there is a bad actor that gains access to your network. Uh, it can be a rogue uh, application that you, you have deployed, or it can be someone from uh, down beneath the Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, something at the, uh, in the cloud vendor or in your own data center. It can sniff the traffic between the backend and the database. And for example, it can gain access to the database password, access the database and, you know, get all the data out. Or it can impersonate the front end app and do all kinds of actions like, you know, um, issue payments, uh, money transfers, and so on. How can we protect ourselves from such, a, such an attack? Um, one way to do it will be to enable, uh, um, to set up TLS, like most, most databases out there um, and all the uh, languages, the programming languages out there are capable of uh, working with TLS certificates and you can encrypt the traffic between services and between services and databases. But if you go that way, that means your SRE team has to manage those test certificates, has to issue uh, those certificates. Your dev team have to, has to integrate uh, TLS in each application, has to switch the traffic from HTTP to HTTPS. You have to configure the TLS certificates inside the database and so on. So it's a lot of work. It's not easy to uh, implement mutual TLS across your, um, across your Kubernetes cluster because you have to touch each application um, and load those certificates in there. When, when your certificate expires, your app has to know that that happened, has to reload the certificate. You have to put those certificates in there and so on. Um, how a service mesh helps you do that, and most service meshes out there uh, have this goal of end-to-end uh, uh, -end encryption, is by using sidecars, like I've said before. So we go from this, we, we have, let's say, three pods, the front end, the back end, and the database. And once you deploy a service mesh that knows uh, about MTLS, it will, inject a proxy sidecar in each pod, and those uh, sidecars will be configured with uh, TLS certificates. Uh, most con uh, control planes out there come with a certificate authority. They rotate the certificates for you. So what are the advantages here? Your applications don't have to know about TLS. You don't have to configure TLS at the database layer. All you need to do is deploy those sidecars and the service mesh implementation will take, take care about end-to-end uh, -end encryption. Another problem, let's say your backend app, no, let's say you have some kind of analytics on your um, front-end application inside your JavaScript, something like Google Analytics. And you get a report from there that, let's say 10% of your um, requests to the front-end service uh, have huge latency. Maybe it takes five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. How do you know where is the problem? Because you see this from outside uh, your system, right? Maybe it's a query in the database that um, is responsible for this kind of latency. Maybe the backend is choked, uh, or maybe it's something uh, in the front-end app. How can you solve this without a service mesh? Well, you have to instrument your applications. You have to um, measure how much time it takes for each request. Maybe dump it in a log, process those log files, uh, make a report so you can discover where the, the latency comes from. What service is responsible for, for that latency? If you use a service mesh, something, for example, like Istio that has um, distributed tracing. Um, 
what happens is because all the traffic is routed, ingress and uh, egress is routed through this proxy sidecar. The sidecar will, uh, will be able to add uh, tracing headers. So when a request comes from the ingress gateway and hits the front end, from the front end to the back end, you have a trace for all these requests to the database and back. So if you use Istio with something like Jaeger, or if you use AppMesh with something like X-Ray, you can easily detect where the latency problem is. Maybe it's a query, maybe it's something in the backend, right? Uh, and you, you get this tracing capability without instrumenting your application, without your application being aware of Jaeger or uh, X-Ray, they don't have to push data there or record it. Another example, let's say your backend application is starting to, um, to respond slowly and you discover it somehow, right? Uh, normally what you'll do, you'll create an horizontal pod autoscaler and you'll set, okay, if my backend CPU usage is over 90%, add another um, replica to it. So you'll start scaling up the backend, but the front-end app, when it makes requests to the backend through the Kubernetes CNI, the, the Kubernetes load balancer is just, uh, it, will, it will distribute the load even across all these backends, right? So maybe you want to say, I want to hit for, for new requests, the front end, I want to hit the backend replica that is, has the less requests in process. So it's, a, it's another type of load balancing, right? That Kubernetes cannot actually do that. Is raw robin or nothing. Uh, with a the, with the service mesh technology, you can instruct the, the proxy sidecars and, and configure those sidecars with different types of load balancing. So you can, <clears throat> you can better um, scale your system. Another example for, uh, let's say, you don't want to scale your front-end app based on a CPU usage or memory usage. What you want to do is, usually you want to scale uh, your front-end app based on the number of requests. But Kubernetes has, the Kubernetes HPA controller has no such metric of HTTP requests or gRPC requests. When you use a service mesh, these kind of metrics are there. So you can easily put a Prometheus adapter for the HPA autoscaler and say, okay, I want to scale up my front end. Uh, when it hits 100 requests per second per pod, when it hits that limit, add another pod and so on. So you, you also get um, a better, smarter autoscaler by using uh, service mesh implementation. And there are many, many other features to service meshes. Um, I made a collection of what does a service mesh provide, but um, not all uh, service mesh implementation have all these capabilities. Um, first and foremost, service discovery, right? Um, you may wonder why we need service discovery when Kubernetes already has this uh, capability. Well. Um, the service mesh service discovery is built on top of Kubernetes uh, services. So when you, when you deploy an application, let's say you have a deployment file and a cluster IP service, usually what, uh, what the, ser the service mesh control plane does, it discovers those cluster IP services and registers them uh, in the proxies. So it needs to distribute um, the, the service definitions across all the proxies inside your cluster. What that means is that this kind of configuration is eventual consistent. There is, there is no way if you run, let's say 1000 pods, uh, at, that in that second, all those pods will know about the new one. So have to, have to take this in consideration that when you use a service mesh, the service discovery is eventual consistent. And some uh, service meshes also use uh, caching. So 
the proxy, the, the sidecar proxy has a cache of all the other uh, definition in there. So when you make a request inside the service mesh, you don't have to um, query the control plane and say, where is everybody? They already know about it. Uh, um, another thing that the service mesh provides is load balancing. Um, one interesting thing about load balancing here is that you can do consistent hashing. What that means is that you can enable uh, um, something like uh, session affinity. What's a session affinity? Let's say your app, it's a stateful app, and if, if a client access your front-end app, let's say, it needs to access all the other sequential requests have to be routed to the same instance, to the same pod. Using something like uh, a load balancing based on consistent hashing, you can uh, achieve this uh, session affinity. Other things uh, that service mesh adds to the Kubernetes uh, round robin is list requests. So you can say uh, for new requests, forward them to the uh, pod that has um, that's, uh, that, uh, that's processing uh, uh, less requests than the others. Also, you have zone and latency aware things. Uh, is someone writing on the chat? Because I cannot see it right now. It's just me wondering if we lost your video or if it's just me. I can see it. Oh, really? Okay. Maybe it's just me. Strange. No problem. Okay, back to the list. Um, communication resiliency. This is, uh, this is something um, also important from a service mesh perspective. Like, if you don't use a service mesh, you have to have some kind of libraries inside your apps that know how to retry uh, HTTP calls or gRPC calls that uh, have timeouts, that implement some kind of uh, circuit uh, breaking, that knows about rail limiting and so on. Um, and it gets harder and harder. The more services you have, the more languages you use to write those services, the harder it will be to keep them updated with all these features. Um, using a service mesh takes away the need of you to actually implement all this stuff inside your application. Uh, because the proxy can do retries for you, can do circuit, circuit breaking so you don't uh, overload your, your network traffic when something goes down. And it can also do rate limiting. If you know that, let's say, um, a web API cannot handle more than 1,000 requests per second, you can, you can configure that rate limiting inside your, uh, inside your cluster without building rate limiting inside your API um, service. Security, it's another... Um, important future. Uh, it has two aspects, end-to-end -end encryption, uh, which can be done with MTLS, and authorization policies. Um, authorization policies are something like, if we go back here, let's say someone uh, gains access to our front-end app. There is a vulnerability there. The front-end app should never connect to the database because everything goes to the backend. If you don't use a service mesh, there is not, nothing stopping the attacker to go from, for, from the front end app directly to the database. If you use a service mesh, and you can um, put in place some um, policies and only the apps that need to, needs to talk to the database, only those applications will be able to, uh, to issue connections to, uh, to the database. So it's another layer of protection that you can add uh, with a service mesh. Observability, it's a great future. Um, you get layer seven metrics. What that means, you know when an HTTP 500 happens, uh, when a 404 happens without having to instrument your apps, without having to look at logs and so on. You get tracing and you can build other things on top of those uh, layer seven metrics. Most service meshes uh, out there are exporting these metrics to Prometheus. And with Prometheus, it's very easy to, to build uh, alert, an alerting uh, system on top of it with Alert Manager. 
another important feature of, of service meshes is uh, routing control. What that means is that you can shift traffic between, let's say, app versions, and you can also do with some service meshing, service meshes mirroring. And last but not least, a very important feature, uh, every service mesh should have <laughs> a programmable interface, an API. And most of them come with Kubernetes custom resource definitions, so you can control the service mesh configurations through Kubernetes objects. Let's look at the service mesh implementations. Hey, Stefan. Yeah. Did you want to uh, leave questions to the end, or do you want to do them during? Sorry, I forgot to ask in the beginning. Um, we had one question, so. How can I see it? Uh, it's, I pasted it in the chat. So, in which scenarios is API rate limiting implemented using service mesh sidecars, proxies versus API gate gateway? What are the pros and cons? I'm not sure if this is a much longer answer. No. Um, so, if we look here for the front end app, if the front end app, let's say it's a web mobile API or something like that, it makes sense to implement rate limiting at the ingress gateway level something with, let's say, Nginx or uh, Glue or HA proxy. There are so many um, API gate, um, reverse proxies slash API gateways out there that have this capability of ensuring rate limiting. But what happens if your backend is an API, right? Your front end will not go through the ingress gateway to reach the backend. So in a, let's say like, um, function as a service platform, everything must go through a, through a gateway, but that adds latency. So you'll just route all the traffic outside the cluster to reach another service that not so, um, you know, not, not that good for every use case. So if you have a backend API, you should use rate limiting to, to defend it against, uh, I don't know, some other app that you know, there is a bug, it goes crazy, it makes 1,000 requests per second. Uh, instead of bringing down your whole uh, backend, that, uh, that rogue app, <laughs> that bug will, will, be, um, will, not, will not cause a disaster, right? You can stop it there. Okay, back to the service mesh implementations. Um, of course, there is Istio. Istio has a control plane uh, that's um, made in Golang and uses uh, the Envoy proxy uh, for data plane. Some uh, disadvantages of Istio is a complex system. You can do everything with it. It has tracing, it has logging, it has MTLS, it has um, authentication, not only a, a service to service authentication, but it also has user to service authentication. So you can use something like tokens to uh, validate, um, validate the token when the request comes into your cluster and so on. Um, one downside to Istio is that from my experience is a resource hungry control plane. The more services you add, the more uh, metrics you want to collect, the telemetry service and the policy uh, service, the mixer, the pilot, and everything needs more resources. But this is getting better from, uh, uh, from each version to another. And from what I've heard, uh, Istio will uh, resolve the mixer problem and um, it will get better soon. <laughs> Uh, another service mesh implementation comes from AWS. Um, app mesh is a managed control plane. Um, you don't have to run it. You cannot run it on your own cluster. It's totally managed by AWS. Like Istio, it uses the Envoy proxy for data plane. And it's, it's very similar to Istio in, uh, in how, how the data plane uh, works. AppMesh is uh, new, it's a new technology. Um, it doesn't have all the ECO features out there. It has no MTLS, no traffic policy and other stuff, but it's evolving and 
at some point, maybe it will be a future parity between the two. I cannot say. Uh, another popular service mesh is uh, Linkerd. And I'm talking about Linkerd version two, which is uh, rewriting Go and um, Rust. So the control plane is written in Go and the Linkerd proxy, which makes the data plane is written in Rust. Um, it has no distributed tracing capabilities. I couldn't find something like that in the roadmap, but uh, soon uh, Linkerd will have uh, uh, traffic shifting capabilities is on the roadmap. There is a service mesh interface uh, implementation uh, that will, from what I've heard, next release will come with, uh, with traffic shifting. And that will help a lot with building um, progressive delivery pipelines on top of Linkerd, which now it's, it's impossible because you cannot control the traffic inside the cluster. Um, and the last implementation I've put on this list is Console Connect. Uh, I don't know. I don't know much about Console Connect. I didn't write. What I know is from from their documentation. The control plane is uh, managed by Console itself, and the data plane has to be built in inside your app. Um, it has no layer seven traffic management. Even if I, I've seen, you can use an Envoy proxy with Console. So maybe adding that Envoy proxy to the console connect to get layer seven traffic management. And it has no Kubernetes CRD support yet. Okay, let's look at some examples from here. This is how Istio looks. The, the control plane is made out of uh, many services. Uh, Pilot is the, is the service in charge of uh, distributing uh, the configuration to the sidecars. Uh, and Galay is um, distributing configuration to the mixer. And mixer is uh, the service that uh, is in charge of policy checks, telemetry, and has all these um, plugins, these adapters. So you can send metrics to Prometheus. You can send uh, uh, tracing to Jaeger and logging and many other things. And it also comes with Citadel. Citadel is, uh, is in charge of uh, configuring TLS for the proxies, rotate them and so on. Um, inside the Istio control plane, there is also a um, Prometheus uh, server. And you also have um, Kiali, which is an observability tool. You have Grafana with dashboards and many other things. Uh, how Linkerd looks is, is quite similar to, to Istio. Um, the, the control plane has a couple of services. Identity is, uh, is the one responsible for uh, TLS. And instead of the Envoy proxy is a Linkerd proxy. Right? And it also comes with Prometheus, Grafana, and it also comes with a, with a nice uh, web interface. Okay, so we got to the second part of the presentation. How does progressive delivery uh, fit together with, uh, with, with the service mesh? So progressive delivery is continuous delivery with fine grain control over the blast radius. What that means is that when you deploy something, you want to, re uh, you want to deliver the, the new version of your app um, to a small percentage of, our, of your user base. So if your new version has a bug, has a problem, um, maybe has latency issues and so on, you expose only, let's say 1%, 5% um, um, of your traffic that version. So, and you can easily detect that something is wrong and automatically roll back that, that fault, uh, faulted version. So the building blocks of progressive delivery uh, are user segmentation. This is what the service mesh uh, offers. Traffic management, of course, observability and automation. I, no service mesh out there does um, manages uh, workload deployments. You need something like a service mesh add-on that 
builds on top of, of these capabilities and can drive the progressive delivery workflows for you. Or of course, you can do it manually. So to, to showcase how progressive delivery improves uh, Kubernetes, let's look at how a rolling deployment strategy looks like. So this is something you can do today with uh, Kubernetes, no, no service mesh, no nothing. So have you one, you update your deployment spec to V2, you apply it and what Kubernetes does, it will um, spin up a V2 pod. If the leafness and readiness check uh, passes, it will add that pod to the load balancer. What means is that a third of your traffic goes to V2, right? If that, that's okay, if, uh, if the checks are okay, it adds an, another pod and afterwards it kills uh, the V1 pods and replace them with V2. So let's say V2 has a, has a bug and that bug is not, um, is not visible from a leafness or readiness check perspective. You cannot just test your whole application with, with, uh, with a readiness check or leafness check. So if V2 has a problem and let's say you discover it before the, the rolling uh, update finishes, um, you'll expose uh, um, at least one third of your uh, user base to that faulted version. Right. How can you improve that? Um, can you improve it using a canary deployment strategy? And this kind of deployment needs, uh, needs something like a service mesh that can, uh, that has a fine grain control over the traffic. With a, with a canary deployment, you can say, I want to expose only 5% of the traffic to V2. So route, let's say you start with 5% and you keep adding uh, traffic to V2, you reach 50%. If everything is okay, everything is good, then you replace V1 with V2, right? Another, another way to leverage the service mesh capabilities, uh, you can do dark traffic deployments. What that means is you spin up V2 and you mirror the traffic from V1 to V2. Of course, this doesn't apply to all services out there, but it's a, um, it's a great way to ensure that your new version works fine with, the, with your current production uh, traffic. And I want to talk about Flagger a little bit. Uh, at the beginning here, I said that the building blocks are user segmentation, traffic management, observability. Okay, you have all these tools uh, when you use a service mesh, right? You can build Grafana dashboards. You can look at your app while, it's, while you are deploying a new version, detect that, oh, okay, something is wrong, manually edit that, those YAMLs and roll it back, right? You can, you can do this, but if you have if you want to be, uh, I don't know, free of looking at, uh, at dashboards or maybe you have hundreds of services running in your cluster, this doesn't scale. You cannot have dedicated people to look at dashboards every time you do a, do a deployment. So what Flagger does, it creates a, um, a shadow deployment of your, uh, of your app called primary and when you change something, let's say you change the uh, container image, it spins up that uh, new version, it routes some traffic to it, it reads uh, from Prometheus uh, metrics like um, HTTP uh, error rate, latency, or custom metrics like how many connections are open in my database and so on. And based on those metrics, on those KPIs, you can validate that the, the new version is okay and only then Flagger will, will replace the primary deployment with, uh, with that new version. And Flagger ha implements a, a couple of uh, strategies. You can also apply things like A-B testing and it works only currently with Istio um, because AppMesh has no um, header, headers or cookie uh, routing capabilities. 
what A-B testing means, you say, okay, if, if um, a header is present or a cookie is present and that header has a value, I don't know, uh, something like test user, only for those requests, you will route the traffic to the, to the canary instance and you will expose only those users to the new version. Um, that's that's A-B testing. And um, a third um, strategy that Flagger implements is, uh, is blue-green, where it spins up the canary, it, uh, it runs um, um, conformance tests with, let's say, Helm test or uh, some other uh, testing platform. It runs um, load tests tools, so it can measure how your new version reacts to um, um, to load, and if everything is okay, if all the metrics are looking good, then it uh, it promotes the canary uh, in production. So this is how Flagger leverages um, service mesh technologies to um, to give you an automated way of running the progressive delivery workflows. And that was my presentation. Now. Thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions that just came in at the end, and thanks for posting there, everyone. Uh, Daniel asks, does Flagger do any kind of comparison against a baseline deployment, or does it only take the metrics of the canary into consideration? If it's the latter, canary, do you see any downsides to not using a baseline in your comparison? Yeah, th that's a good question. So <clears throat> I will... Um, I've implemented Flagger, the, the first implementation of Flagger was only by looking at the canary metrics because I didn't want to spin up a clone of the primary deployment. Um, but it, this is on the roadmap. I, at some point I will do the baseline comparison. Um, as of today, you can decide if a canary is good or not based on thresholds and metrics that only the canary exposed exposes. So it's, uh, it's different to how Netflix does canary deployments. Awesome. We have another question. Uh, does Flagger work with Helm? Yep. Um, so Flagger uses a custom resource definition called canary. And um, one second, I'll, I'll show you. So there is a custom resource definition that defines how you want your canary to be analyzed, how you want your canary to be exposed outside the cluster. If you use Istio, you can attach it to a gateway, you can set host names, um, redirects, course policies, and all this stuff. This file can sit in a, um, in a Helm chart along with your application. There is also an example of that chart uh, here. So here is a pod info, a demo app, and inside the templates has a deployment spec and a canary spec. And a canary spec refers um, an horizontal pod autoscaler and any deployment that are inside this uh, hand chart. So, yeah. And also in the docs, you can find the uh, dedicated section of how you can run um, canary deployments with Helm and also integrate Helm test before the traffic is routed to the canary. Excellent. Um, we have a question um, to go back to your um, slide where you're talking about um, your different bullet points and one of them is service discovery. So the question is, um, what does ser service mesh discovery offer that Kubernetes own built-in discovery does not offer? It's a good question. It, you can for example, in Istio, you can register outside services as entries inside your cluster. So when it calls a database that's outside 
a mesh outside your cluster, that database has a DNS record and a destination inside Kubernetes. Of course, you can also do that with uh, Kubernetes services as well. So in my opinion, it doesn't add um, to the Kubernetes service discovery much, but it builds on top of it. So it distributes that inside the mesh, all the cluster IP um, endpoints. Any other question? Cool. Oh, thanks for these great questions that people are offering. Any last ones? Let me give it a moment. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks for these great questions. Seems like uh, people are coming here to this intro, but you've at least done some research and thought about, or maybe tested out some aspects of service meshes that are out there. Okay, um, I'll still give people one minute, but while we're waiting, I will get back to my slime deck. You guys, oops, did I just share the wrong thing? Strange. Is it still sharing the wrong thing or am I looking? Okay, people do see my slides. Okay, just a strange Zoom function. All right, well, hopefully you can see my slides. Thanks for coming. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're new or if you've come to these before, um, these are sort of these series that we've been putting online. Um, we're going to generally stick to Tuesdays for this season. Uh, hopefully that works for you. If this time frame does not work um, or is difficult for you to join, feel free to let me know. Uh, next week, we've got Brian Borham on our team who is um, covering Prometheus Cortex and some PromQL. And of course, we have more at our Weave user group. Um, if you came to us through a different means, check out our meetup page. That's the best way to um, be up to date on our calendar. So, uh, you know, this topic kind of covered the topic of GitOps um, and progressive delivery. I don't know if we actually mentioned the word, but I think it's pretty, pretty pervasive now. Um, as I mentioned, we're working on a Kubernetes platform. So if these types of concepts or this type of work is something that you'd like to do, then our platform will definitely get you there. So if you like more info, please feel free to email me um, or you can join us on Slack if you haven't joined already and we are there to answer your questions. So with that, We'll double check to see if there's any other things on chat. We've got Stacy here, by the way. Anything? I don't see anything oh. else. Okay, looks like we're good. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for joining, and I'll see you next week. Thanks, Stefan. Bye. Bye.